Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to session two of this three-part series on leveraging Google tools in the arts classroom. Uh, so happy to have many of you returning back with us this week. Uh, we started this series two weeks ago, uh, where we did a really broad overview um, of, of many of the different things that you can do in Google Classroom uh, as an arts educator. Uh, and today we're going to focus a lot on Google Forms, which many of you use for quizzes. Um, and there are so many other great uses for forms that uh, our guest presenter, Judy Mahalik, is going to guide us through. Judy is a Google certified educator, uh, and she's also a music educator um, at the Cohen School in Bangor. And did I get that right? Yeah, no, I'm a Dowdy. <laughs> oh, Dowdy, sorry. She's at the Dowdy School. In, um, in Bangor, and we are thrilled to have her as our guest presenter today. Uh, as always, if you have questions along the way and Judy's in the middle of something and you wanna drop your question in the chat, uh, I'm gonna keep an eye on that for everybody. Uh, and then we will have some logical stopping points, hopefully, where we can uh, address those questions. Uh, and then if we've got some time at the end for some targeted um, questions or troubleshooting, we will definitely do that. Um, and before we start, because I don't want to forget to do this, we have picked a date for the third session, and it's going to be uh, the Wednesday that we get back from vacation, which is the 24th of February. And if you've registered for this series, and obviously you have because you're here, um, I'll be sending out a reminder email with that date, and it'll be the same link that you use to get into the first two sessions. Um, but again, it's going to be from 3.30 to 4.30, the same time slot on Wednesday, the 24th of January, or February rather, and that will finish up our three-part series. So enough of me yammering on and on. I'm gonna turn it over to Judy because she's got great stuff to share with you today about Google Forms in Google Classroom. Hi, everybody, and welcome. I would just like to ask um, if you could, if you could drop in the chat um, your uh, what you're doing now in education, like where you're teaching, what your grade levels are, um, what your subject content area is, just so I know, so I can go back and look at that. And I'm going to try to keep my eye on it as well as I'm um, presenting. So what I want to do right now is I'm going to start off with a little bit of a slideshow to do an overview of what forms can do. And then we're going to jump right in. And we are going to look at Google Forms, how to create a form, some of the ins and outs of it. I've got a couple of uh, tips and tricks that I've picked up. And I was telling Jason before we started that um, Google Forms is something that I've used in my own classroom, but I've only used it for certain purposes that fit my needs. And preparing for this, I've learned all kinds of other things about it that are pretty cool. So I'm excited to share that with you. So I am gonna share my screen and I am going to share a slideshow that I'm doing. I'm not gonna put it on present mode if that's okay with everyone. That way you can see what's coming up. So can everyone see my screen okay? Am I sharing all right? Okay, awesome. All right, so what is Google Forms? Google Forms is, actually, I think I can do present. I'll show up in Mercy. There we go. Give it a second to load up. Google Forms is an application that is in the Google Suite tools, and it's an efficient method of collecting information or data. And it saves to Google Sheets, which is a spreadsheet. So you can sort that information, you can make it into charts, you can manipulate it, or you could just keep a running record. Um, you, the one thing that I love about Google Forms is that you can create self grading quizzes. So if it's a multiple choice quiz, like a vocab quiz, the kids can take the quiz, you, they immediately get feedback, they immediately get a grade, you can immediately import that into your grade book. So we're going to go over a few things that can, it can do that's outside of quizzes, which are pretty cool too. So the first thing you need to decide when you're looking at Google Forms is this the best tool for you to use. There are all kinds of tools in the Google uh, suite of um, education tools. And some of those tools would be better for like word processing. Some of your tasks would be better if you did like Google Docs for word processing or a slideshow. Um, but if you are into collecting any sort of data, you want feedback from the students, you want to give the students feedback, this is a great tool to use for that. So what are some things you can do? This is really cool. I went on um, the music educator site on Facebook for Google tools. And I asked, what are some things that you all use your um, Google Forms for? And I got a plethora of responses. 
So here are some of the responses that I got that I thought were pretty cool. And I've investigated some of these. I'm gonna show them to you today. So you can do self-creating quizzes. I use mine for a digital sign out sheet. This year, we're not doing the whole paper and pencil, write your name if you're going to the office or the restroom or whatever. So I'll show you that. I have a digital sign out sheet where the kids actually sign up digitally. And that it's been awesome because it keeps a record of time stamped when they left, when they got back. Uh, there's no fidgeting that like, you know, she didn't see that I snuck out like, you know, at this time, but I really put five minutes later and, you know, none of that. So um, it time stamps everything that they do and it's been really effective. Um, you can do it as exit tickets, as class surveys, like what's your favorite music, um, worksheets. You can do recruitment surveys for, you know, upcoming students like high school. If you're looking at middle school students, you can have them fill out the survey. If you email at home, what instruments do you play? Um, you know, if you were an art teacher at, you know, an upper level, you can have your colleagues or you can have the students fill out what are your interests, especially if you're like trying to design courses for the next year. So you can target students that way. You can have students set their own goals and they can keep a record of that. You can have them update the form as it goes through the year. You can have them do a course evaluation of you. What did they like about your, your course? You can do listening journals like I kind of showed that last week in the Google slideshow. I do my Google listening journal right in the slideshow, but you could definitely do it this way on Google Forms. Um, you can have them do a process reflection. So if they create a piece of artwork and you want them to give you feedback on how they went through the process, you would simply put the name of the assignment or have them put the name of the assignment. And then you could ask them specific pointed questions of things like, um, what process did you go to? What were some of the barriers that you had to get to your end product? Are you proud of your end product? Um, what were some things you would have done differently? So it's a pre pretty cool tool to get students to think. And then it gives you feedback on what their thought process was. You can use it for signing up materials, um, especially if you are like banded in orchestra when you have instruments or if you have recorders and you have things numbered. Um, maybe not this year, but in future years, you could have like a sign out sheet that they all sort of log into and sign out. Then you have a record of who has what um, materials. So there are all kinds of things. One of the really cool things is escape rooms. I'll be honest, I've never created one, but after looking at what they can do, I'm definitely going to create um, some escape rooms to use with my students instead of having like the traditional worksheets. If I had something special when a sub is in, they could go on to looking at some of the worksheets I normally would do with a sub and then turn it into escape room, which I think would be a lot more engaging. And anytime you can gamify anything, kids love it. So, um, but there's all kinds of uses that you can have for Google Forms and that's just a few of them. So there are eight steps to building a form. I'm gonna go over with them with you right now and I'm gonna show them to you in just a minute. So the first thing you do, there's probably five or six ways to get into a Google form to create one. The easiest one is that waffle in the upper right hand corner window, the little nine dots. You go to that and you select the form icon. It will start you right out. Um, you give your form a title. You identify your topic and any information you want to target on the form. Make sure you save all images and audio clips to your Google Drive or to your desktop because you can drag them right in that you're going to want to use with your form. Um, you can add sections and questions next to organize your material. And then you can customize your colors. If you don't, everything is gonna be purple in Google Forms. Google chooses a different color for each of its tools. Purple happens to be Google Forms color. It's my favorite color, so I love it, but it does get boring if you look at that purple form over and over again. And then they start to look the same for the kids. So you do wanna customize it a little bit. Um, then you wanna check all of your settings and then test your form before you send it out to your students or to, you can even do this like with parents. Um, anything that you need. So there are different types of questions that can be asked on the Google form. You can do a standard multiple choice question. With multiple choice questions, the student have to select one answer. They can only select one answer. Then you can do check boxes, which students can select multiple answers. A drop down menu, which they drop down to just like a standard drop down menu you'd have on any other form that you would do. Students can upload a file to you. Now this is convenient. This is nice. If you've got students that are practicing at home, and they have something like GarageBand and you want them to record into that, you can then have them upload that to um, Google Forms and then you can give them feedback on their practicing. Um, I'll be honest, I have not tried this. This should work in theory. Um, so I would be interested to see if that would work, but if it's a file, it, sh it should upload perfectly to it. 
and then you could do feedback to that. You can have a linear scale, which is um, how productive were you in class today? One being I was not productive at all, five being I was very productive, and students can fill in what they think they were for their productivity level or anything like that. Um, multiple choice grid, so it's a grid question. And again, they have to select one, so they can have like two or three different options. Like um, if you had choose your favorite food and then you gave um, say ice cream and it's my absolute favorite, I'm okay with it. I don't like it at all. They would have to choose one of those three. And then you can have a grid checkbox. Again, with grids, they can choose multiple answers. You can have short answers, you can have paragraphs, and then you can actually add the date and time. So the benefits of using forms are the self-grading quizzes are awesome. They take a little time to set up, but once you have them set up, it will save you so much time in the long run. Um, you can sort of gamify worksheets to make it more engaging for students. Um, it's an easy way to keep track of anything that needs to be signed out, including when students leave on their own. Um, students can upload material and you can respond back with feedback. Um, in the art classroom, they could take a picture of a piece of art that they were working on. They could upload that into the form and then you could have questions in the form that they can either fill out or you can give them feedback with. Um, you can do a quick formative assessment with your students. You could check for comprehension. And then once created forms can be reused for many different classes. So once you create a quiz for one class, you can reuse that quiz as many times as you want for as many different classes, which is pretty cool. All right, so that's all I have for my little slideshow. Now I think what I'm gonna do is stop for just a second. And just Jason, if there's anything in the chat right now that need to be, needs to be brought up, just let me know. Nothing so far, just a list of everybody um, with where they teach and what their assignment is right now. But Excellent, no, anyone no have questions, questions yet? At this point. All feel right. Free to yeah, feel free to unmute yourself if you do have a question. Yes. All right, so I'm going to go on to how to create a form. Now, if you are interested in self grading quizzes, I suggest that you go into Google Classroom and start there and select your assignment as a quiz assignment. I'll show that in a minute. But if you are interested in anything else, this is one way to get in. And you can still create a quiz this way, um, but it's a little bit easier if you sort of have the mindset in classroom that you've got a quiz going on, if that makes any sense. I hope that made sense. <laughs> All right. So if you go over here, the little waffle that I was talking about is right here. It's usually right beside where you, your name is, where your identif an identifier is. And you click here and there are all of your Google apps. If you don't see it, you can go down to the bottom and then more from Google Workspace Marketplace. If you are in the education suite, it should be there. Okay, you may have to rearrange. I've re you know, you can rearrange your apps here. So you can have the ones that you use most common. You just, they're just drag and drop. Okay, so these, this is, these are the most common ones that I use. So you click on forms like this. And then what I'm gonna do right now is sort of take you through making a basic form um, of how to get some information out of your students. One thing I really like to do is I like to um, have my students when they come to me, do a basic form about themselves, um, their legal name as it would appear on um, Infinite Campus, which is our grading program, nicknames that they have that are accepted, um, their pronouns, so I know what those are. Um, and then I have them sometimes give me their birthday, sometimes I have them give me their favorite color, just to, so I get to know a little bit about them. So we're gonna do a very similar form to that right now. So you'd go over to your Google Forms and then down at the plus sign right here, you would press that plus, and then you can see it comes up just like this. It's an untitled form. So I'm like moving the faces around so I can see all of the things I need to see. There you go, now you're down at the bottom. All right, so it starts with your title. You wanna title your forms something that's meaningful to you. Um, if you don't, it's gonna be called untitled form and you're gonna have 5 million of them. So I'm just gonna call this one getting to know you. And then, it automatically, when you click over here, will rename over here your form. Okay, so let me show you a little bit about what we have going on right here. This adds, this little plus sign will add a question. Okay.
Okay, this will help you to import questions from previous forms. So if you've used a question in a different form and you want to use it again in this form, you would click on that. And then you would go to whatever form you want. So I'll go to the, I've already got a tell, tell me about you form. And then if I wanted to like get their legal first name, I would just click on this. Okay, and then I can import that question. It's probably right down here at the bottom underneath your pictures. Yes, right there. So I can import that question. And so do you see how that just sort of brought that right over so you could see it? Okay, it's a quick way of adding questions if you've already created these questions someplace else. So I'm gonna add though um, their legal last name. So I'm gonna put in last name. And did you see right here, Google Forms automatically knew I was asking for a name. So did you see how it's selected from multiple choice? It went right to short answer. That way you, it, you don't have to go with its suggestion, but it saves time, which is pretty cool. All right, and then I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna to go to your nickname. And again, it's gonna be a short answer. So the next question that I wanna do is, I wanna know what the student's pronouns are. So, now you could do that as a multiple choice, but I usually do that um, as the checkbox because when you do a checkbox, it would also give you the um, option for other. Um, you can do that in multiple choice, but I will be honest, I sometimes have questions that are uh, students that are gender fluid and they go back and forth between two. That way they can choose more than one if they want to. Um, so if you did do the option of, I'll do both multiple choice, you can see what it looks like. And then you just click enter and it goes to the very next cho choice. And then if I want to do other like this, they can click other, okay? But I don't believe that they can put that in. So if you go back right here, you can see that there's a little eyeball right there so you can preview what the students see, okay? So it does allow them to do other, it does allow them to fill, fill it in, okay? Which is good. Um, so that's how you add a multiple choice question. Now, if you want to close out this, so you can go back to where you're editing, you just close the box right there. And I do want to leave that. And I'll go back to where I'm editing. And Judy, I don't want to steal your lesson plan, but go ahead. as as you hover over those options, everybody can note maybe that there's a little picture of an image. So yes. that you can so you can add an image for students to pick from instead of having to use text, right? Absolutely. So what you could do is if you had this, you could go over insert image. You can either upload it. You can do it from your from your camera. So you could smile and take a picture if you wanted to. You can go to your photos. You can do it from your Google Drive or you could do a Google image search. So if I put in um, like a happy face, hopefully I'll get appropriate stuff. <laughs> I can something like that. <laughs> and so you can insert it right there. And the happy face appears right there. And then if you go back and you look at the eyeball, which shows you what the students see, you can see that you've got a face that's associated with that choice. Okay. Do you so have that, to have do you have to have the text with the image, or can you just have the? No, image? you can just have the images. Okay. You could just have images. I thought so. Yep. Yep. All right. Any questions so far? All right. So um, let me show you just a couple of other question choices. So let's go down to the next one right here, and. Let's go to what a checkbox choice looks like. Um, name three of your favorite foods. Okay, so option one, ice cream. Option two, broccoli. And again, I could put in pictures with these if I wanted to. And so with the younger learners, that would be very, very helpful. If their reading skills um, need some scaffolding, you could do pictures with text. Um, you could do pictures with text. You could do just pictures. Um, you could do just text. It's totally up to you. Um, ice cream, broccoli, and pizza. 
All right, so then if you go up here to the eyeball, you can look at it. And again, the students can choose all three of them, two of them, it's totally up to you. Um, let's go back just for a second. And I do wanna show you a couple of things. I'm gonna back up just a little bit. When you go to edit a question, if you look right down here, you can turn these on so they're required or not. Okay, so do you see how that, that little star with that first one, because I imported that one. That means it's required. So if I checked in there, do you see that I turned this on to required? Okay. Um, I also can put down a response validation and we'll talk about that if you're doing escape rooms. Um, they have to get a specific response when you're doing a quiz in order to get it right for an escape room in order to go on to the next step, which is pretty cool. And then you can turn it on to be quiet, uh, required. You can throw the question away right here. If you don't like that question, you wanted to trash it, you could and you can duplicate the question. So if you have similar questions coming one right after the other, that's the perfect thing to do because it will duplicate the questions then you change like one or two words. When I'm doing vocab quizzes, I often do that and I just change up my definitions. When you get to the very end, you can shuffle the definitions, you can shuffle your questions. So that way you don't have to type every time you're making a question, okay? So if I get down here, I can make this required. So they have to have to answer these, okay? I can turn that on and I can turn this on. Okay, any questions so far with that? The only question, Judy, that we've had right now um, comes from Linda, I think. Yep. And it had to do with once you create a form and that her school uses Schoology as their platform, do you know if there's a, a Chrome plugin that helps to, to bridge that gap? Or would you just suggest when we go to the send menu to copy the URL and put that as a Schoology post? Uh, that's a good question. I, we don't use Schoology, so I am not versed in that. Um, but you can, what Jason said, copy and paste the URL and send it that way. And it, it will behave the same, exact same way. Um, so it'll still live in your Google I'll Drive. I'll look that one up. That's a good question. Yeah. And I can get back to you on that. So it's Schoology. And of course my pen is dry. So Linda, <laughs> it will still it'll still live in your Google Drive. Yes, it will still. It yep. won't live in a Google Classroom per se. Yeah, I know I can do Google Docs. I just wasn't sure about the forms because I want to use it as an assessment. So yeah, you can you can do it the exact same way that you would use it with a Google Doc. Okay. Copying okay. the URL. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing if you can use docs, you absolutely can use forms. They behave the exact same way. All right. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Um, let's see, where was I? Oh, question. So let's add a different question. Let's add. I want to show you what a file upload looks like, which is pretty cool. So this is a file upload. Um, when you have a file upload, students can upload files to you within the assessment. So this works out well if they're doing like a writing prompt and they want to work in a Google Doc to do that and have a longer prompt and then attach that, they can do that this way, okay? You can also allow it to only um, have a specific number of file types. So this is what they give you for options. You can allow them to um, do a document, a spreadsheet, PDF, video, presentation, drawing, image, and audio. And the audio is one that I'm most excited about because I can see with my um, students, if they're practicing, recording like in GarageBand and exporting as MB3 and then uploading as an audio as part of their assessment. So I think that would be pretty cool. But that's also awesome for if you have your students do drawings, um, they can take pictures and you can insert it as an image. So you could do something like insert your audio of your let's see, of practice exercise two. Okay, so if you have practice exercise two, um, you can set the file max, the, um, the size, and you can have it so they can only do one file at a time. Okay, you could have it for do five files, 10 files. It's totally up to you. I don't know the parameters of your systems at your schools. Um, 
I think personally, my preference would be to have the students do one file at a time per question. If you want to upload more than one, I would do more than one question to go with that, just to keep everything straight. That's how, personally how I would. But if you want to have like three or four, like if you they practice five times this week and they had five exercises they recorded for you, you could have five files right there. Well, and Judy, I see a really great opportunity here to teach your students about being selective about what they want to put forward for an assessment. So if you want to create a format and a structure where, like you said, they record themselves five different times and you want them to submit what they feel are their three best, then it's it's requiring them to go through a, an adjudication process. And that's a, a great skill. Um, and, and you could do that for any number of, you could do that for a set of drawings for like a, um, a daily drawing journal or whatnot. So I, I see some really great potential with that. This is super exciting. I, I haven't seen this feature yet, so this is really cool. It's pretty cool. Um, so if you go back, let's look at the eyeball and see what the students see. I'm gonna see if I have an audio file. Oh, I'm getting bogged down. <laughs> here we go, there we go. Um, so if you go back here, you have the add file. And then you can drag and drop. I don't know what this audio file is. It says it's a demo of something. So I'll put it in and see what happens. <laughs> um, so then you just upload it. And then it's attached. I don't know what you're gonna hear right now. Probably a garage band demo that one of my students did for me. And I think it's just getting bogged down. Yep, and then. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty cool that they can do an MP3 and you can listen to it and you can adjudicate it and put it right in your form. So I'm going to close that right out. And we'll go back. Oops, I closed out that form. Oh, no, there it is. Okay. All right. So any questions with that? All right, so let's go to a few more question types. So after the, oh, the drop down menu is just, a, I think you all know what a drop down menu is and they just select the right answer. It's very similar to the multiple choice. Um, it just depends on how your students are used to working. So the linear scale is, as I said, um, how are you feeling today? And option one, terrible, option five, Awesome. And then if you look at that, it will put a linear scale out for students to see. And they would choose their option. Okay. So that was pretty straightforward. That one's pretty cool to gauge, like, how did you feel about a lesson? For exit tickets, I use this one a lot um, about their level of confidence, level of feeling of mastery or not. Uh, it just gives me a good gauge on sort of the mood of the class and how they're feeling about it. And remind me, Judy, I don't think there's a way on here for you to label each of the spots. And that's a shortcoming, I think, on this option is it, you right. can't label two, three or four. You give you give right. both extremes of the spectrum. So yeah, but um, you could do though is in the actual explanation of the question, how are you feeling yeah. today? You could do one terrible, two, you could yeah. do it right here. And that way they That's know a way what around that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's add moving right along. Um, the multiple choice grid. So again, in the multiple choice grid, the students can only choose one option. So if you did something like um, oh where are you from? And then you could do something like um, Bangor. Um, Lincoln. I go to Portland. And then in column over here, you could column one is yes. So column two, whoops, I need to get rid of the column one. Or actually, you know, call to, you know, let's do where have you lived? That would fit, that fit better. So 
So if you view this one now, students will have two, you can add more columns if you want, um, things to choose from and they have to select where are you from? So where have you lived? I've been lived in Bangor, yes. I've never lived in Lincoln. I've lived in Portland. Okay, so that one's pretty straightforward. Um, and we'll go back and do a couple more. And then the last one is, the checkbox grid. Now the checkbox grid allows you to check off more than one. So this would be like if you could choose like two or three answers. Um, so of course I'm blanking on a question right now. Um, we could go back, I always go back to foods. <laughs> I must be hungry. <laughs> Which foods do you like to eat? And then you could add your columns over here. So you could do vegetables, meat, um, dairy, and do you do you eat daily? Dairy. And then column one, um, every day, sometimes, whatever. Pretty sure this will work out. All right, so which foods do you daily? I eat my vegetables every day. I, sometimes I eat them, I, so it could be every day or some days. So you can see how that kind of works. That wasn't the most ideal question for that, but <laughs> you can see how the checkbox works. And then the last options are, the date and the time. Now those I use um, at the very beginning when I want, especially like sign out sheets, when I want someone to tell me what time they signed out, that's perfect or what time, um, you know, it, it, you can like have them do the timestamp right then and there um, for, you know, when did you submit this form? You're gonna get a timestamp anyway, but it makes them think about it as well. Um, but I, I use it, the only real option I use it for is as I said, uh, Google sign out when they do their digital sign up for me. So I'm gonna stop there for a few minutes and then I'm gonna show you some forms that are already done Oh, you know what, before I do that, let me show you how to personalize them. We talked about being in purple all the time, because um, this is pretty cool. So up here under settings, first of all, this is really cool because every time they do a form, you can have them collect their email addresses and you can send receipts to them if they request it or you can choose always. You can limit them to one response so if they're taking a Google quiz in classroom and you don't want them trying it over and over again, this limits them to one time so they can't go back in and edit it. Um, what I do for retakes is I make a copy of the quiz and then I choose it so the students can um, retake it, but everything's been shuffled again. So they're taking the same material just in a different order. So you can do that or you can have them so they can edit it. And you can have them so they can see summary charts. Now, when I do music opinion surveys, that's how I usually start with my eighth graders is, you know, what's your favorite music? Um, what's your least favorite music? And then they can see a chart of the class. They can't see everyone's individual responses, but they can see, oh, 50% of the class likes rap, you know, 20% of the class likes classical music. So it's pretty cool for them to be able to reflect on that. Um, so those are some options that you can choose under the settings. And then how you present it, there can be a bar that shows how many questions you've done. This is where you can shuffle your question order, which is really cool. It shuffles them, I'll talk about sections in a minute, but it shuffles them within a section, not within the whole quiz. So it keeps your sections, your divisions um, where they need to be. And I've got a quiz I'm gonna show you in a minute that is a perfect example of that. And then, um, but within that, it shuffles the question order. And then you can show a link to submit another response. 
And then if you are doing quizzes, you can make anything a quiz. You can release the grade to them immediately after the submission or after you manually review. So if you have a um, form that you're doing as a quiz and you want to do like a short answer or you want to do, um, you want to review their answers manually, you can do that. If you're going to just do a straight vocab quiz, uh, the feature I always choose is immediately after um, submission so they get immediate feedback. You can give them feedback on missed questions, correct answers, or point values. Okay. Oh, and one thing I just saw at the very last minute, which is really cool, if your kids have Chromebooks, you can lock it so they can't get out of the window in the Chromebook that they're in. So they can't have a couple of different tabs open and reference back and forth between your work. You don't have to have this. Sometimes I let my kids go ahead and go back and look. That's sometimes that's part of the assessment process is can they find the right answer? And sometimes I just wanna see what they know. And so that's awesome. You can't do that on MacBooks though. That's a disadvantage of using it on the MacBook. All right. So then the other way to personalize it is with customizing the theme. So you can choose your theme color right here and it will switch it. And you can choose the background color, any color you want. You can choose your own image. Um, they have all kinds of themes that you can choose from that are preloaded. So you could choose this one. If you notice, once I choose this one, it's gonna change the color. It was pretty close, but it changed it slightly. And you can still choose the colors. If you go up to the top, you can see that I now have this as my theme. Okay, you can change the font styles too. Um, although I find when I do this one, my kids can't read it. So it's just way too cursive -y. but you can make them, especially if it's like opinion surveys and things like that, you can make them um, just a little bit more personalized. You can even add your own images. So you can upload an image. So you can drag and drop something in and that could be your image. Um, I've done that on a couple of mine that I'm going to show you in a minute. Okay. Any questions right now? You can go ahead and turn your mics off if you have any. I think one of the huge takeaways, Judy, with this is, I mean, we're, we're seeing the, the capacity of Google Forms to offer us a variety of different modes of asking questions. And I just, I think one of the big takeaways with this is, you know, experimentation is is great with this. It's going to take a while before you get the quiz in its final form. I think you're going to have to try a lot of different things with your students to see how they respond. And I, and again, depending on the subject matter, you know, certain questions are going to lend themselves um, to the situation easier than others. So it's all about experimenting with it and and putting it out there. And uh, and I'm I'm always happy to take a look at things too if you want to send something my way. Uh, I'm happy to give you feedback and, and help support you in that you know, as we go forward. I'm always happy to help you. Um, go ahead, Nancy, do you have a question? So I've just started using this this year and I've done two forms for kids and I don't know what I did, but like, and of course I did it for the entire grade level. So there were like 70 kids instead of per classroom. So the answers came in, but one way I did it, you could just click and I could see all the kids' answers and see who did it. And then the other way I did it, I don't know what I did, but you have to go through like each email address and then go down. So I'll show some, you. Yeah, yeah, I know what you did. <laughs> uh, so, I can do that in a minute. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, and that's the thing. I always, like my digital sign out sheet, to be honest, is one sign out sheet that I've assigned to all the kids in all of my classes. Um, they all sign out on the same sheet because I want a running record during the day. Um, but when it comes to like quizzes for classes, I individually assign those to classes, if that makes sense. So I have one sheet that my kids all access for that. And then the quizzes, I just basically they duplicate them. And so I think what you did is if you look up here under responses, um, you, I don't have any yet because I have, this is a practice quiz, but that's where you'll see, you can choose, do you want to see it by email address? Do you want to see individual responses or do you want to see them all at the same time? You also right here can export it into a Google Sheets. And so you can sort your information that way too. 
So I'm gonna show you some that I have done already um, that my kids have responded to. And then you can see those different ways. All right. So is everyone ex okay? Are there any more questions? I can go on now or I can take more questions if you have them. All right, I think I'll move right along. Um, what I wanna do now is just show you some quizzes. And um, while Judy's pulling up a quiz, the one of the coolest things about forums, if you're not very familiar with them, is taking a look at the data afterwards, because Google Forms does a fantastic job of giving you uh, different graphic representations of the data um, based on question. And it's 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 really very cool to, to help you do a quick analysis. I'm just going to go through right now and give you a bunch of different ways I use forms. I'm not going to take you through the whole form, um, but just show you some different ways. And then after I'm done that, Nancy, I'm going to go in for all of you. I'm going to go to a form that's been filled in by my students so you can see how the data is presented. So um, the first one I'm going to pull up for you right now is one that I start. It's a good icebreaker with all of my students. It's my music opinion survey. Um, so I have, again, this is one that I use and I duplicate. So they come in, they tell me which mods they have it. Although I can pull it by individual classrooms. Um, I have them start with this. And to be honest, this is one of my first day assignments. This is one of those things where kids don't know what class they're in. Cause I change every quarter and like, when do I have music again? So it makes them sort of like say, believe it or not. Yes, <laughs> you have it mod 10, my, mod nine, mods nine, 10, you know, my, you're my sixth grade class. Um, and then I do like, how much do you listen to it a day? And this is where the check boxes come in. Um, what are your favorite genres? Choose as many that apply. Um, what music do you really dislike? Um, and then I have them choose only three. What are your top three favorite genres? It does, I don't specify that in, you can't specify like how many for the kids to choose, but I put that in there to see if they could follow directions too. Um, it also is a good lesson of, you know, really look what I'm asking for. Same thing here, what's your least favorite type of music? Choose one. And then that's always like shocking when they look at the data that they've gathered for their class. You know, and they're really usually surprised what their class's least favorite is. And then in your opinion, what's the um, most popular type of music for your age group? So maybe not necessarily what they like. And then what type of music do you think gets overlooked? And then how do you use music and so on and so forth? What name, and then these are the short answers, names of favorite artists. And then a little bit longer of an answer, more of a prompt, you know, how do you use music in your life? So that's one of my favorite ones to use with students. Um, let me go back. Like I'm the yearbook editor. And so one of the ones that we use is getting kids to submit pictures for the yearbook. So they give us their email address and the grade they're in and they, this is because I copied it. Um, they give um, the grade they're in and then picture just to, to get their attention. It's grade eight students, put your baby picture in here, put your name, and then they upload their file right there. So that's how you use gathering data. I mean, sorry, gathering files. Um, I'm gonna have a million tabs open if I don't keep closing when I'm done. All right, so um, the class course evaluation is very similar. It um, basically has students go through and tell me what they got out of my class at the end it gives me feedback on how i did and you can see this is the use of one of those check sheets how what their feelings are about me and how the class was do i care about them um do I, did i want to help them did i explain topics clear enough uh, gives me some very honest feedbacks when kids know that they um, are taking a survey like this and I keep them. I mean, I, I do get their email addresses simply to give them. I give them points for just doing the survey, but I don't really look at who does what it gives me some very, I just look at the charts. It gives you some very honest um, information about how I'm doing, which is really important to me. Um, how the workload, this has been important this year, having to learn different learning paths. Sometimes we go remote. Sometimes, you know, we're here, surprise, you're not going to be here tomorrow. You're going to be learning from home. This has helped me really evaluate the workload for students because it's been so much different this year than any other year. Um, and then things that they thought found were important. So that's a really cool activity to do with kids. And I can share any of these. The self-reflection form is very similar to that, but it's how they felt about my class. My digital sign-out sheet, this is what I use every day. 
The kids all know how to use it. Are all of you using sign up sheets similar to this? A lot of you using sign up sheets similar to this? Because it's very cool. So they put their name, um, where they're going, um, the current room, because I don't know about you, I'm teaching in different places in the building this year because I go to core cohorts. Instead of having all of them come to me, a lot of them do, but a lot of them I go and teach in the room that they're in all day. And so they give the current room, time out of room. And what I do is I have them put the time out of room, but keep their laptop open. It's not like a sign out sheet. Like when I tell a student they can go to the restroom and I get sidetracked and can't remember who I sent because I'm getting old. Um, I will often say, okay, put the time out, but leave your laptop open. And I can go over if their screensaver hasn't kicked in. I can go over and check out what time they left. And then the time back in, they put the time back in and then they submit at the very bottom when they're back in. But it gives me a visual of, oh yeah, that I did give that student permission to go to the restroom. Cause as I said, I'm getting old and I lose track of things like that. I know so I let someone go, but who is it? Um, here is a quiz that I do with my students um, on treble and bass clef. And this is what I did, I told, was telling you about I did in different sections. I have the, I always click their names first. You always wanna do that identifying data, even though it gets um, email addresses, you always want that identifying data. And so I've sectioned this one out. So the first part of this is I want them to tell me, do they have the names of the lines and spaces in treble clef memorized? Um, so I don't necessarily have them do, this is my general music class. Some of these kids have never read music before. So I don't necessarily have them have to look at the second line up and see the note there and say that this is G because I find that for, especially for a lot of my students that um, have need some scaffolding, that's a lot to ask. So I just ask them first part, just tell me, do you have a memorized? I give them multiple choice. And then what's like the bottom line? Can you tell me the bottom line? Can you tell me the third line up? Then I go on to the next section and I have them have an, a reference chart. The only thing is, is you can't pin this. And so when I go to shuffle the question, so they're not looking at exactly what their neighbors have, then um, this can be sort of in the middle of the, the question. So I make sure that I put it up on my board and I show them, this is in there, you can use this as reference. But they can't go back, they can't go from section to section. Once they've left this section, they can't go back. So they don't have this chart to look at to do that first section. So as you can see, I put the notes. And then if you look at an individual question, you can see that I've marked the correct note here. Okay. And I've given it a point value of one point. This is my answer key. And so now when this is run as a quiz, it will self-correct. So it knows that if a student chooses this one, they're choosing the wrong answer. Okay. And they will get the feedback that E is the correct answer. All right. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. But I have that for treble in base clef. That's a really quick way of just sort of checking for comprehension. Um, that filmmaking vocab quiz is the same thing. That's all multiple choice. This is an escape room, which I'll be honest, I downloaded from Teachers Pay Teachers because I haven't done one yet. And I wanted to see what one would look like. But again, this is done in sections. And I hopefully, if you are interested, I'm gonna be a little more advanced in this because this is my next project just to learn how to do this. But you can lock sections so students like they would have, this is music and math. I think they're learning some sort of code. I know this spells out trumpet because it says so right there. And so the students, what they've done is they've specified that they have to have the word trumpet. Um, if you were gonna do something like this, I would say put it in all caps or put it all lowercase, specify so the student does it this way. You can have it all lowercase. You can have it um, in all caps. You can like put two or three different ways they could spell it and then it would correct it would accept it as a correct answer so i'll be honest this is like one of those areas that i'm not super proficient at but i'm excited to learn because it looks it's really cool, cool. Yeah. judy do you have um I just, before we run out of time do you happen to have a a quiz that has um aggregated data yeah. that we can see those pie charts and stuff so everybody can kind of get a, yeah. a feel All for right. what the time it was so let me just go back awesome cool uh, thanks I'll grab one uh, one of my students. While Judy's pulling that up, I, I dropped in the chat for everybody uh, a tutorial that I found on Google Forms that will take you back through from a different perspective a lot of the things that Judy's kind of covered today. 
So in addition to getting a link to this video, once it's um, up on the YouTube channel for the department, you can also check out that other YouTube link that I gave you and it, it, again, it'll give you a different perspective. Sorry, my computer's really slow because I'm projecting. Let me go to one and see if I can find one that my students have done recently. Okay, let's look at the music opinion survey. Let's see, let's see if this is one that I have responses to. Hold on, just say it will take a minute to load the responses if I have them. Okay, so I have 19 responses right here. So if you go over to the responses. Okay, first of all, you can export this into a Google Sheet right here. Okay, so if you do that. It will say, do you want to create a new spreadsheet? And you do, and you create, and then you can see this all out in a Google spreadsheet. And it will go right into your drive automatically. So while it's doing that, because it takes a minute to create, you can see I have the email addresses of all the students that have answered. And then I have their responses. Um, you can see the pie charts. And they can see this as well. And then you can see percentage of the answers. Um, and then I think I might have to go in through classroom to get it so I can see what the students' um, individual answers are. I don't know if I do this one. Oh, right here. No, right here. So this, I think this is where you were, Nancy, is that if you click on the individual summary, the summary is right here. You probably clicked on one of these up here. And so probably individual. So you had to go question by question. I'm guessing. So this is the student. This is so, how they answered. So does everybody see at the top of that where it now gives the student's email address and it says it's student 12 of 19. And then you can arrow back and forth through those or you can print that individual student's result, or just like Judy said, you can select from the list. Or, or you can individual question, which for a quiz, this is awesome because I can see um, like this is question one, but I could see if I had marked things right or wrong quickly, like if I had made a mistake and there were 19 wrong answers, it probably was me. And so I can see, you know, have I made a mistake or did I neglect to teach something shows me, you know, if this question doesn't, you know, was not answered accurately by the majority of the class, then I might have missed something. So I go back and I change that. It's a really awesome way to do a formative assessment for myself and for the students. Maybe I wasn't clear enough about something. Okay, but that's right up here. That's probably what you were, you were seeing. So if I can go now, you can also see this is what um, this looks like. Okay. These are all the, the uh, questions and then the students and what they did. I'm gonna show you right now from Google Classroom what it looks like. Um, this is my pretend class with my fake students. And one of them has taken the vocab quiz, one has not. And so this student has already responded. You can, he can view his score and it shows him right up here. He got a 65 out of 100. If I go back here and I change that to me, What I can do is I can import that grade right into Classroom. And so the grade is imported. And then um, I can then use grade transfer and transfer that over to um, Infinite Campus, which is my grading program that we use in our district. But grade transfer, which is this little icon up here, which we talked about last week, has been a lifesaver. So if I go over to classwork and go to the quiz and then click on it. Oops, sorry, I went to the wrong one. I can then, do you see right here, I've got it set up to import grades. I can pull those right in. And now we will see that my student bill Got a 65 out of 100. So it saves a lot of time. It will pull all of your students' grades right there, which saves a ton of time. So. All right, we only have a few minutes left. So Jason, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and 
see if anyone has any last questions. Awesome. Thanks, Judy. Thank you. It, it, it is a lot, everybody. And I know that we covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. Um, again, I get back to the the idea that it's it's all about experimentation. It's all about trying some new things. And um, and again, Judy and I are more than happy to um, give you feedback on forms and things that you create. So um, I'm encouraged that you're all going to be able to to try to incorporate more of this um, into what you're doing to again to hopefully make your job a little bit easier. Um, uh, Judy dropped her email in the chat box. I also dropped the link to the exit ticket for this session in there. And remember, after you submit your exit ticket, you'll get you should get a a, a text response um, on the screen after you submit it. And then there's a link there that you can copy and paste into your browser, and it will take you right to your PD certificate for this session. Uh, just a reminder, everybody, that we are going to have the third session in this three-part series is going to be the Wednesday that you get back from vacation, which is the 24th from 3.30 to 4.30 in the afternoon. And we're going to focus, uh, Judy, on uh, rubrics there, I think, right? Using the rubric feature in Google Classroom. And I wonder too, Judy, maybe we might want to take 10 minutes, five or 10 minutes or so, and look a little more closely at that grade transfer. Yes. Because I think for a lot of people that are using um, Infinite Campus or other um, student information systems, that could be a big time saver as well. So maybe we could just go over that again uh, and answer anybody's questions that they may have. And I also love to have you, if you have specific needs, specific questions, I'm willing to do like a Q&A for the last, you know, 10 mm -hmm. to 15 minutes. Um, if that's something that would appeal to people where you can bring your issues and I can try to help work you through those. Um, I don't know if that's something that anyone would be interested in, but I am more than open to that. And you can email me at any time with those questions. But I also know that if you have the question, probably other people do too. And so it's a very effective way. If you bring a question to either spur something that somebody else thought of or to help them with an issue that they may not know that they have, they may come up with it, you know, in the future. So um, I would be open to that if that's something you all want. I think that's great, Judy. Thank you for offering that. Um, I would suggest to all of you that if you click on that link to the exit ticket right now, it will open up another tab in your browser and that way you'll have it when this session is over with. You could save the chat and then you just have to go back and copy and paste it later. So if you click that link to open it right now, it should open another tab in your browser and then you can go um, complete that exit ticket uh, whenever you have the, the time and the thought to do that. Um, I want to thank you again, Judy, for being a great presenter today and lending your expertise. I want to thank you all for being with us. Remember, you can reach Judy and I by email um, in between sessions. I hope that you all have a fantastic vacation next week. Again, if there's ever been a year for you to earn, have earned a vacation, it is. And listen, I was a teacher for 14 years with you guys. It's not about earning vacations, okay? That's like we earn vacations in the first week of school. <laughs> so, but I hope that you all uh, enjoy it and really find some time to unplug if you can uh, and find some things to do for you. And we'll see you back here uh, the Wednesday that we get back, that last Wednesday of February for our last session in the series. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye.